Good morning. Welcome to Google I.O. Day 2. Welcome to our session on what's new in Android development tools. We are so glad you joined us today, and we're really excited to show you all the great things we've been working on to help you make great apps. As a reminder, we look forward to your feedback, so please fill out the, fill the, fill the survey after the session. As far as introductions, we are part of the Android Developer Tools team. Myself, I'm Jamal. I'm the product manager on Android Studio. Hello, I'm Xavier Ducroy. I'm the tech lead for the Android Developer Tools. And I'm Tor Norby, and I'm the tech lead for Android Studio. Last year, we announced an early preview of Android Studio, and we're continuing to invest in Android tools. Since launching the preview, we have had thousands of active users. We, are, we had great feedback, and today we're glad to announce Android Studio and Beta. <laughs> so Android Studio now helps you develop apps with all the great new development models introduced in the L Developer Preview, as well as supporting Android Wear and Android TV. We'll show you a few demos and some tips and tricks on how to make you more efficient. As you heard in the keynote, we also improved Android Studio to integrate Google Play services and Google Cloud services. Lastly, with the Android Studio Beta, we have enhanced the Android Studio Gradle infrastructure. Building on top of the product flavors and build variants we introduced last year, the Android Studio build system now supports multiple APKs and supporting form factors like Android Wear. With that, Zav will dig deeper into the build system. Thank you, Jay. All right, so <clears throat> our build system is based on Gradle. You may be familiar with it by now. If you're not, um, our strategy was really to create a unified build system so that whether you're building from inside Studio or from your CI server, it's always the same build, right? And we wanted to have a build system that was extremely flexible that would, as Jay said, you know, support the whole ecosystem, whether you're targeting you know, a watch now or targeting you know, multiple APKs, uh, you know, a paid version, a free version, uh, or you know, different ABIs. Um, so we wanted really a lot of flexibility. And we wanted also to enable a lot of code reusability. We heard a lot from people saying that they wanted to have a lot of libraries and you know, split their code into various modules. And so Gradle is really the core uh, strategy for that. But the biggest thing is that we wanted that whatever customization you need to do, uh, it would always work inside the IDE. So this is really like the integration between Gradle and the IDE is really our, our, our strong focus. Uh, so when we look back uh, you know, on the last 12 months since the last I.O., uh, we did a lot of features and bug fixes, you know, a lot of around variants and things like that. Uh, we did some performance improvements, and we focused a lot on ID integration. And so it's not a surprise that our current focus is still the same. Um, variant support, again, being able to generate multiple versions of the same APK. Uh, a lot of customization and APIs for you to extend your build, uh, create new plugins. There's already some plugins out there that are built on top of our plugin. We're really excited by that. Um, we need to focus a lot on performance. Uh, we know a lot of you are not super happy with the current performance, and we're doing a lot of work there. Um, and we're again focusing on ID integration. The ID integration is really important. Um, you know, today when we're announcing beta, it's because we spent the last 12 months doing a lot of work on making sure that the communication between Gradle and between Studio is as ready as, you know, well, it's not really ready yet, but it's, it's very close, right? And you know, if you've been using beta for 12, uh, Studio for the last 12 months, you probably have had a lot of issues when you upgrade to a new version of Studio, and then it tells you, well, I need a new version of Gradle, and you upgrade to that new version of Gradle, and then your build script doesn't really work anymore, and you have to edit it, and it's really painful, right? And so today we're kind of like saying, okay, this is beta. We are committing to being a lot nicer to you guys uh, and making sure that, uh, you know, Whenever you get an update, it won't be as bad. And um, you know, you, we'll have deprecation period of time where we change things so that you have time to adapt to, to the new version. Um, so let's talk a little bit about variants. Uh, for those not familiar with it, uh, a variant is really a way of generating multiple versions of the same APK. Uh, and there, there's multiple ways of doing that. The first one is through a concept called build types, which controls how your application is packaged. Uh, is it a debuggable version? 
Uh, is it not a debuggable version? What is it signed with? Is it running ProGuard? Is it not running ProGuard? Um, so it's the typical debug versus release, but you can create more than that. You can create new build types. Uh, maybe you're accessing a server and you want to have a version that access your production server, a version that access a staging server, a version maybe that access a local, you know, on your desktop server. So you can really control all of that. Uh, the second axis is product flavors, which really controls what your application is. And the typical use case is paid versus free or any other sort of, of differentiation that you want to do. Um, and it's a very flexible mechanism. You can you know, have custom manifests for each of those. You can have a lot of source code uh, separation. Um, and it's also something that you can use right now to do multiple APKs that the Play Store support, like per density or per ABI um, multiple APKs. So for example, you're publishing a game, you're going to want to have one version with the ARM code, one version with the x86 code, and one version with the MIPS code. Um, even though it's possible to do it that way, it's not super efficient because the flavors are really meant to be very separate. And when you split, for example, the ABI, what you really care about is just the final packaging to just you know, have three different APKs, but everything else is the same. Uh, so we're going to introduce very soon a, a concept called multiple APK splits, which is a much more narrow and focused concept about really just doing density and uh, ABI splits. And the um, benefit of it is that the build will be much faster because all the things that are not specific to that split, so anything that's not relative to building native code, for example, will be shared across all the, um, all the variants. Um, we also added some features in the last 12 months. Uh, we added variant filters. So variants are really a combination of build types and product flavor. So if you have a certain number of build types and a certain number of product flavor, we're going to make every possible combination of those. Uh, there are some cases where you don't want those combination. Uh, for example, if you're splitting per density and you're supporting gingerbread and ICS on different APKs, well, there was no gingerbread extra, extra high devices. So you don't care about that particular combination. So you should be able to say, I don't want this one, don't build it, you know, so that you don't build things that you don't care about. Next, we improved a lot of dependencies. So when you have product flavor, you're probably going to have different depend uh, dependencies, right? So for example, let's say you're doing a paid and a free version, uh, your free version will probably, you know, maybe be ad supported, and so you're going to depend on the library providing your ads. Uh, to do that, you'll have a dependency only on that version. So the variant mechanism is, uh, the dependency is like, for each variant, we combine all the dependencies coming from the different elements, like the main dependency, the build type dependency, you could have a debug only dependency if you wanted. Uh, and then a free only dependency if you want it. And we combine all of that together. On top of that, we also have different type of dependencies now. That's something that we improved a lot recently. Um, you used to have mostly a compiled dependency. Now we have a provided dependency scope, which is only used at compile time, but is not packaged with it, with your application. We have a compiled scope, which is the regular one. It gets both used at compile time and at packaging time. And then we have a packaging only uh, scope, which is called APK actually, uh, which is only used for packaging. So you could actually do something where you link against a particular version of a library, but you package a different version if you wanted to. And then uh, finally, in, in, on the variant side, uh, we have a new manifest merger. Uh, so this is really a, a very important part because when you look at your variant, um, you, know, you could have some, uh, for example, permissions that are very specific to your debug. For example, you know, in order to have better crash reporting, maybe you want to use the read logs permission, which really you shouldn't be using on your final version. So you're going to have a manifest in your debug build type that, is, that includes that permission. On your flavor, you're probably going to have, you know, if you have ad support, you may be needing the internet permission, so you only do that on the manifest of your free version. And then if you're depending on some libraries coming from somewhere, either your own or third party, those may also be needing permission, may be declaring activities, declaring services, and you really want to merge all of that together. So the old merger was pretty basic and didn't do much. Um, it didn't do any merging of any node. So for example, if you had a library that defined an activity and you wanted to reuse that activity node coming from that manifest, but wanted to tweak it a little bit, you couldn't actually do that. Uh, so it was really a big problem. So the new one allows you to really merge nodes coming from other modules uh, and to really have control over the merge and, and to really be able to do what you want to do. Uh, so for example, here, what you have is an activity 
um, that, so this would be in your application, and let's say that this particular activity, and the way to identify here is the class name, right, uh, is coming from your library, and all you want to do is basically replace the label with a different resource. So here you say Android label, you put the label, and then you have this new tool replace attribute that says just replace the label. And it's imp we're very strict about it. Um, like, you can just replace it without telling us you want to replace it, and that's because if you say label, if the label is not defined in the library, you can set it in your application. But if suddenly, without you knowing, the library defined its own label, it needs to tell you, well, you know, there is a problem, right? You did re add it when it wasn't there before, but now it's there, so you should break. So we, we force you to explicitly say what you want to replace. Uh, another feature we added to the manifest merger is the ability to inject values into it through placeholders. Uh, the big use case here is things like the provider authority, where it's very dependent on your package name. And we know that you know, when you have a lot of variants, you know, they can have all a different package name. And then you would have to basically duplicate that provider uh, scope in each of those variants. And that just didn't really scale, right? So here you have a single provider in the main manifest. And you just inject the final package name for the given variant. <clears throat> OK, so another thing that we worked on variant is variant publishing, which is really, um, so here's the issue. The variants, uh, the libraries also have variants. And by default, they have debug and release. So of course, when in your application you want to build for debug, well, you kind of want to use the debug version. And that doesn't work currently with Gradle. Uh, and then when you introduce flavor, there's a lot of work that needs to happen there. And so we're working on that. Uh, it's not there yet. There's some changes that we're working with the Gradle company, the company behind Gradle, to, to make that happen. Uh, but it's something that we're very aware of. I think it's one of your top-rated bugs on our bug tracker. Uh, and it's something that we're focusing a lot on. Uh, so things will happen there. Uh, customization. So we did also a lot of work on helping you customize the build script as much as you want. Um, so we have a bunch of new parameters here and there. I think the most interesting one is the build config, uh, which is a class that was created automatically. And you know that added a debug version. So now we automatically inject the package name, which is especially important when it changes on each variant. Uh, we inject the version name, the version code. We inject which variant and uh, which flavor and which build type you're using. And now you can even inject new versions. Uh, so it's very convenient if you just want to inject a few flags that you want to use. You can also do that with resources. It's very limited to like value-based resources, so string, integers, and dimensions, and stuff like that. Uh, and if you want like really full uh, customization at the variant level, we have you know different source set also per variant. We used to only have like the debug source set, the flavor source set. Now we have like pet debug is a source set that you can use to do customization specifically for that variant. So for example, here's a, an example of a build config. So here we define like two flags, feature one and feature two, that are both fo uh, false by default. And then in like the paid uh, flavor, we override it, you, just the f uh, feature one to be true. So that way, if you have some code that's not really variant aware yet, and you just want to put a quick switch saying, hey, if I'm in that flavor, do something in that other flavor, do something else, you can do it easily here. APIs. Um, so we. We did a lot of changes in the APIs. Um, one thing that you need to be aware of is that as a developer, you're going to create a, you're going to define your build types and your flavor. You're never saying, I want a particular variant, right? You always only say, here's my build types, here's a dimension of flavor and the value in it, here's my other, other dimension of flavor, and here's the version in it. And from that, we do all the combination ourselves. And you know, I mentioned earlier, we have that variant filter to at least be able to exclude some, uh, some variant. So, to be able to actually do work on a variant, uh, we have an API that once we create all those combinations, you can go and query, you know, go and look for variants. Uh, you can uh, actually, right now, we, you can only loop on them. We do want to have a better query API to be able to query for a set of variants based on, for example, give me the debug variants only. Um, but right now, you can only loop on them. And then you can do a lot of work on them. You can you know, access all the tasks. So you can create new tasks for each variant and inject yourself in between existing tasks. Uh, you can you know, change some parameters on some of those tasks. Um, the build config things, all the things that you can do on the build type, you can also access the merged version of all of that and do per variant changes of all of those parameters. So there's a lot of, of work that's been done there. Um, and we're also, you know, some of those API are actually used by the plugins that I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, that 
go and do those manipulations for you. So we're super happy to have those plugins currently exist. There isn't that many of them. That's maybe like two or three. Uh, but they're already providing so, some good features. Uh, and some of them, you know, so there's an example. One of them is an annotation processor plugin. You know, you just apply it, and then you can do annotation processor in your code. One of the things that it does is that it creates some new code for you, right, based on the annotation processor. And so it's, crea it's creating that code into a new source folder somewhere. Um, and well, we kind of need to tell the ID that there's this new source folder that you need to use, right? So we created some APIs to be able to have that plugin go and tell the model that Gradle sent to the ID that there's a new source folder. And that way, you know, any plugin that's generating some new Java code can automatically be recognized by the, the ID. And inside the ID, you have code completion. It all works even with the generated code by third-party plugin. Um, OK, so we have support for Android Wear now. Um, so Android Wear, uh, you probably saw the keynote yesterday. Um, and you have that new micro app that you can run directly on the watch. Uh, and the way it's delivered is that it's packaged inside the main application, and Gradle will handle that for you. Uh, there's a couple of extra steps that need to happen, like creating an XML file that contains a description of what this app is, uh, and then an entry in the manifest, and Gradle will take care of that all for you. All you have to do is that. Uh, so there's two options here. The first one is you just use the Wear app dependency, and you just link to another project. And that works fine if you use Gradle to build the final release version of your code, uh, because it's going to basically call into that other project, have it built, take the output, and package it. So when you do the release version, Gradle needs to be able to do the release signing of your app. Uh, if you don't do that, then the second uh, mode is something you can use, which you directly point to an APK. And here you would basically, on your CI server, you know, instruct Gradle to build your micro app, do your custom signing, and then create a new job that inject the output of the first job into the second job. You know, I mean, here I put a basic path, but you could inject that through a property, through an environment variable, or something like that. Um, this is mostly done for release. For debug, by default, it doesn't package the, the app. And that's because um, the workflow for debugging is more, you know, you deploy directly to the app from Studio, you deploy directly to the phone from Studio, and, and that works directly. Um, so ID integration. So uh, I mentioned that earlier. Um, we have an updated model, right? We did a lot of work to make sure that the model sync works a lot. Um, and we're going to keep working on that. Uh, we have improved sync. So sync is when we send the model from Gradle to the ID. Uh, and we have done a lot of work also on improving the, uh, the, overlay, uh, the overhead of the build. There's still a lot of work to be done there, uh, but you know, we're, we did a lot of improvement, so you should try it. Uh, and also, we know that there's a huge learning curve to, about Gradle, right? And so we are doing some work inside the ID. We have a project structure UI. We have editor support, and we have a lot of link check to help you deal with creating Gradle stuff. Um, so performance, uh, we know it's very critical. Uh, we are looking a lot at build versus incremental, right? Incremental is the part that really we worry about from inside the ID. And, um, you know, we did a lot of investigation, so we kind of know exactly what the bottlenecks are. And those bottlenecks are, there's really three of them. The first one is project evaluation, which is really a problem when you have a lot of modules. So we see people with like 200 modules, and it takes a lot for Gradle to really load all of those projects and start knowing what to do. Uh, and we're working again with Gradleware to, uh, you know, they're working a lot of work there. So we know exactly what's going to, to happen. Um, incremental support in task, it's making our task be more incremental. So APT is not incremental. DEX is not really incremental. So we're working on that as well. It's, it will come in the you know, next few months. But, um, and then finally, task parallelization. It's mostly important for CI server when you build a lot of variants. From inside the ID, you build only one variant anyway, so it doesn't really matter too much. OK, and then finally, uh, the road to 1.0. Uh, so we just announced beta today saying, you know, this is going to be a lot more stable from now on. Uh, we're not saying there's not going to be any small breaking changes, but we're going to be a lot more careful, right? The, the bar is, has been raised for all changes to not break you guys. But, um, you know, in terms to get to 1.0, we need to finalize that ID model, that exchange between Gradle and Studio so that you can upgrade one without having to upgrade the other one. Uh, and DSL is like the, the format of build.gradle. We don't want to have you to rewrite your whole build.gradle every time there's an update. And then finally, those two uh, other features, variant aware dependency, that's the whole debug versus release for libraries. And the compatibility with the other Gradle plugin is something that we need to look at. It's going to have some impact on the internal infrastructure of the plugin. And we want to make sure that those destabilizing features happen sooner rather than after 1.0. 
OK, and with that, I will turn to Tor, who will give you a tour of Studio. All right. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. On the tools team, we like to think of this as the Thursday keynote. Um, so uh, if you're coming from Eclipse, the first thing you'll want to do is import your project. So you just invoke import project. You point to your main application project. And then you tell us where you want to put it. And the reason for that is that this is uh, not so much a, uh, an import as a migration. So in Eclipse, we didn't have uh, libraries with resources. So you had to do this. You had to, uh, for example, drop in all of Action Bar Sherlock with the source code and the resources, because that's just what you had to do. So in our import, we try to reverse that process. So when the import is done, you get this summary where we tell you what we've done. So you can see that, for example, it found a jar file that it recognized as a dependency. So it just puts in the dependency instead. And that means that you no longer have just a jar file sitting in your file that you have to worry about. Gradle can check this out whenever anyone builds your project. Likewise, it recognized a source library project with all the sources and resources, and it got rid of it and just replaced it with a, a simple resource again. Uh, and last but not least, it tells you how it remapped the source files. So you can see here that it's moved, for example, the resources and the source folder into this main directory. So there's the, the new Gradle build system has a much deeper directory structure, and there's actually a good reason for it. Uh, so let me switch to a slightly more complicated project. So I'm going to invoke the project structure dialog. Uh, and here you can see I have, a, uh, I have several flavors. So I have a free version and a pro version, and I have different you know, application IDs so that they can both coexist in the Play Store. Uh, I have different build types, and those can also have different application suffixes so that I can have them both on the same device at the same time. Uh, and dependencies. So the whole point, though, is that since I have these different source sets, I can actually do per source set overrides. So for example, I can have a debug manifest that gets merged in, so I can have, you know, I can ask for the a mock location only for my debug builds, or in my beta build, I can, you know, change the string, for example, to say this is the beta version of the app. Uh, so that's why we have this new directory structure, uh, but we do realize that it's a bit inconvenient to work with. So now, so now I want to show you a feature we're working on that didn't make it into the first beta build, uh, but it's going to help it help work with these um, deeper directory structures. So it turns out that you can actually choose how you want to view your project. And so we're adding this new Android-specific view. And when you invoke that, you can see we're putting all the build scripts in one place, so you can easily find them, all the manifests in one place, uh, all the code in one place, and my favorite part. <laughs> Wait. Wait, you haven't seen the next thing yet, because this is what I like. So if you've had any uh, non-trivial Android projects, you probably had uh, resource folders that look like this, right? 20 of them, the whole screen. And you had to look for a file. Well, look at the resource folder here. It's flattened. So for example, my drawable folder, I, I can instantly see that I have a launcher icon. It's shown as a single file, but if I expand it, you can see it actually ha have all the different icons. So this makes it a lot easier to find your files. Similarly, you know, in the values folder, there's just one value folder. In here, I can see, well, all right, I have nine different string files. Uh, I have you know, two different style files per version, and I have a couple of different dimension files based on. So anyway, look for this in, in one of the next few Canary builds. All right, so that's the uh, import flow. Uh, let me show you the new project wizard. So uh, one of the things we're doing now, which is simple but kind of useful, is we remember your domain name so you don't have to keep entering it. So we can sort of uh, carry that forward for each new project that you create. And so on the second panel is where you choose your min SDK version. And we've added this help me choose link. So when you invoke that, you can click on the different API levels. And we're showing you the features that came in that API level. And we're also showing a recent uh, distribution percentage for that version. So you can help decide your trade off between features and uh, distribution. So uh, you can see also on this panel that we now have support for the new form factors. So I can add in TV. I can add in wear and glass. And as I walk through the wizard, I get to choose a, an activity uh, template for each one of those form factors. So uh, here is my TV activity. Uh, we have a sample that uh, we're going to show you a little bit later on. Uh, here's my wear activity. And there's a couple of glass activities. So let me show you the design time experience uh, when you deal with wear. So here is a layout uh, that has been designed for wear. And I can, you can see that it's showing it with a square form factor. Uh, later this summer, you may want to also try to switch to the round form factor so you can sort of see what the layout looks like. Looks like. Or better yet, you can show both at the same time. 
So now, when I'm making an edit here, let's see that I'm adding you know, a little welcome label at the top. This might look good in square, but look what happened to round, right? No good. So this would need some more visual tweaks or maybe a per, you know, per uh, shape layout. So speaking of visual adjustments, um, Android has had bidirectional text support for a couple of releases now. And so we've added support for uh, right to left text in the tools. So let me open up a uh, layout that I believe is correct. Uh, this one should work in right to left locales. So let me now, let me now uh, switch to this mode where I can see it simultaneously in right to left mode. So when I do that, I can see my layout left to right on the left and then right to left over here on the right. And I can instantly see that while the name and email looks like it's okay, there's a problem with the phone number. So I could go and fix it, but we also have this refactoring that'll convert your entire project uh, called R add RTL support where possible. Uh, when I do that, it, open up, it opens up this refactoring that basically goes through and fixes all the attributes uh, in, in the correct way. So let's just do that. And you can see that it now updated my layout just to fix it. Now, if you're doing custom use, you probably have to do some work on your own. Uh, but certainly, if you're using the built-in widgets, uh, it should just work. Uh, uh, and by the way, you know, if you're making edits in the layout editor, it should do the right thing to begin with, right? So I put a button in the left that shows up right aligned properly. All right. Um, so let me show you uh, the action bar. So if you look at the action bar on the right here, up until this morning, the layout editor would only show you the title of the application. We just had some design time hacks to put that in there because it's very difficult for us to know what the activity is going to do. But uh, when we know the activity, we can actually, as you can see, figure out what should go in the action bar and show you those icons right there. In fact, I can even click on the, the overflow menu item and see the menu. And if I click on one of the menu items, actually, sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing. If I click on one of the menu items, it'll navigate to the corresponding menu file. So now I can obviously continue to edit in the menu file and see you know, the, the visual effects there. Uh, and we're hoping to have some more graphical way of actually add, adding menus uh, soon. All right, so uh, let's talk about the new material design. So as you can see, this is not material design, this is hollow. And the reason for that is that this, uh, this app has a application theme and where we've explicitly asked to inherit from the theme hollow. So let me... Um, go ahead and upgrade it. And the way you do that is to just inherit from Material Lite instead. Quick tip, when you're doing code completion, press tab, not enter, and then it'll just replace the whole string. So when I do that and I jump back to my layout, you can see it now does the new L preview rendering uh, correctly. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see there was a red underline, and this is saying this is not safe because using this theme requires API 21, and you're trying to support API 9. So we now have a quick fix for this which basically says, you know, when Lint says that there's an API violation, you can override it in the right folder. So I'm going to invoke that. And now you can see it's created a values21 uh, folder with a file. And I'm just going to put a hollow back in the, v11, the v14 folder. And I'm going to put material in the v21 folder. So now I've arranged for this to work correctly. Uh, but how can I be sure? Right? So now I'm going to show you a different feature where I can actually ask for it to render this layout across different API versions. So when I do that, you can now see material design. <laughs> right. So you can see material design, and you can see the new navigation buttons, and you can see the hollow buttons over here, and of course, gingerbread without the action bar and without navigation buttons. So another cool thing in material design is that the, uh, that the theme lets you actually add color. So the way that works is that you go into the theme and you can override a couple of attributes. So I think it's color primary and I've already predefined a brand color. So this can be anything. There's actually two attributes I wanna set, color accent. So when I set my own colors, but you can see in the gutter here, it's a shade of blue, bluish. When I go back, you can see we now get our own sort of branding. So it make, it's this, this new theme makes it very easy to add your own splash of color. And it's not just for text. You can see that even the widget here is using this color. 
Uh, and more importantly, you can even do this for bitmaps. And the way that works is you can see we have a XML drawable here. Uh, I've already applied a tint. So this is what the image looks like to begin with. And I can apply a tint, which is the same color resource. So you can imagine you could set a few color resources in a few places and theme the entire app. You no longer have to go and generate bitmaps to get your own look. Um, so uh, since you're going to be working with themes, we've added a new really useful feature to the quick documentation. Um, so quick reminder, quick documentation is F1. You know, when you're in code, you can just press it on a method call to see what it does. If you're in a resource file, you can press F1 to see, for example, all the translations of a string. Well, themes are particularly useful. So uh, quick reminder, when you have a resource URL that starts with an app, that's a normal sort of resource reference. When it starts with a question mark, that's a theme lookup. It looks up the resource in the current theme. And look what happens when I press F1 on this one. Let me make this larger. So here, it's telling me what, the, what this resolves to, the style. It's walking up the style inheritance, showing me which styles I'm picking up for which attributes at each level, and resolving all of those. So I can quickly see what text appearance medium will look like in the hollow theme. So this basically makes it a lot easier, I think, to work with themes. It's a bit like a DOM inspector in web design tools. All right, um, let's look at some code. So uh, Studio is built on top of IntelliJ, and IntelliJ already has hundreds of code inspections. So it flags uh, erroneous code, uh, erroneous code in, in your various uh, files. Uh, as you can see here, it's saying there's a possible null pointer uh, problem here. There's some unused code and so forth. And on top of that, we've added some Android-specific checks. So here, for example, this is an integer parameter, but it's expecting an integer resource that represents a layout, and we're passing a string, which is clearly wrong. So when I fix that, uh, it's happy. So we're making sure that you're calling the framework correctly. Um, and that's all well and good. But wouldn't it be nice if you could check your own code? So now you can. Uh, here's a method that I've added where I'm taking a couple of integers, uh, one representing an ID and one representing a drawable. And let's add some annotations on this. So uh, I'm going to say that I am expecting this integer to represent an ID, I'm expecting this one to represent a drawable, and now you can see it's flagging problems in the code where it looks like I've flipped the parameters. So the compiler was happy. So we basically have added you know, a, a, some type checking to the resource system. Uh, and if you basically build a library, it also will export this metadata so that anyone using your library uh, will also get the same types of warnings. Uh, so that's um, inspections. They basically, you can see, show up in your code as highlights both in the, in, on the right as well as in the code. Uh, IntelliJ also has something called intentions, and they're invisible, right? So the trick to know is that in certain places you can press Alt-Enter, and it'll offer to do certain things. So for example, here I have a string, and it'll offer to extract this as a string resource. Uh, likewise, here I have this if statement, inside the if, where there's a cast, I can invoke it, and it'll say, hey, do you want me to insert a declaration with a cast here? Right? Or, or I have some nested ifs, and I can merge those into a single, or maybe I can split them apart. Uh, you'll only discover this by either trying Alt-Enter everywhere, or you can open the options. And there's actually an intentions uh, list here. I would like to encourage you all to read through it and click on each one, it'll tell you what to do, because you'll become a much more productive programmer with this editor. You'll find that you never have to sit and create methods, you just write the method call, press the right keys, and all of a sudden you have the method inserted. So um, this is a really, really powerful uh, IDE that we're building on top of, and so you're gonna be much more productive uh, if you really get to l learn all the ins and outs of it. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Jamal, who's gonna tell us about our future plans. Great. <laughs> So great tour, that was great. Uh, a lot of great, cool features. So the keynote yesterday, we talked about and introduced the L developer preview. With the preview, we give you a, a set of few extra tools, including a few tools to make you more efficient in making apps. On the developer tools website, you can now download system images for the Nexus 5 and Nexus 7. Also, we've enabled the Android emulator to support Android TV and Nexus device emulation. Let's switch over to the second demo. 
So in, in the emulator, now you can switch between the new Lean Back experience. And as you're developing your Android TV apps, you can also try out the new Lean Back Discovery, Discovery View as well. So switching over to the Nexus 5 emulator, we also talked about the new no notifications. And so in the emulator, you can also try out the new notifications. You can swipe that away. We've also included inside the emulator the, the, the new calculator application. And here you can see the new sort of the material design, the new ripple effect as well. And lastly, we also included a new uh, demonstration of the dialer. Dialer. Home screen. Uh, bottom right. Yeah. Where is it? Bottom right. Bottom yeah. right. Dialer. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and again, you can see sort of the, the new ripple effect on the different tabs and columns as you move around. And again, the, if you can't, you know, don't have a Nexus 5, Nexus 7, you can try the emulator. Also, you can download the images from the website as well. So great, let's switch back to the slides. So as you, as you can see, you can try out your new app and new design language on the Nexus 5 or Nexus 7, or you can try it out on the emulator for the TV and for uh, the Nexus 5. So. What's next? So hopefully you enjoyed what we showed you. We showed you a lot of great tools and tricks for, from the L Developer Preview. You can also still download Eclipse ADT, but as you can tell, we're spending most of our development effort on Android Studio. On Android Studio, we showed you a lot of new features to make all your great apps for these new form factors, but we actually didn't show you all the great things. There's still more stuff that you can actually try it yourself. So as far as next steps, we talked about a number of things about the build system. The goal is to focus on stability and performance. From the build backend to the IDE, we're looking at making the entire development experience faster and more efficient. You can check out the details of our, our work in progress on our roadmap on the tools.android.com website. As you try out Android Studio Beta and the L Developer Preview, we welcome your feedback, and please let us know how it is. And that's it. For Q&A, please visit us at the Android booth uh, on the second level at 10 o'clock. We actually have a few minutes. We do have some minutes, I guess. If anyone have any questions, come to the front. Uh, uh, uh. And then uh, lastly, so leave, leave feedback on the QR code or with the I.O. app. And thanks again for joining us, and we enjoy uh, coming this morning. So Q&A. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Conrad. I'm at University of Washington. And um, uh, my group focuses on accessibility. And um, there's not that many tools to like, develop accessible uh, smart, uh, smartphone applications. Are you working in that sphere at all, and like making more support in the um, developer tools? Well, we have some things. So uh, Lint goes and looks at your code to make sure that you're not making mistakes. If it finds an image without a content description, it'll complain. There's, I know a lot of uh, support in the framework as well. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure if we have anything planned. Uh, we, we should definitely do something, but I don't think we have a lot right now besides those lean checks. Okay. Uh, I have uh, two things. One is, uh, are you planning on supporting multiple testing profiles? Like we use RoboElectric, and you have to kind of override the main one, but we also do integration testing. And secondly, are you going to support testing outside of an emulator or device so you can run it headless on like a server? Um, I couldn't quite hear all the details. Uh, I heard RoboElectric. <laughs> okay, so uh, basically, are, are you going to be able to support multiple testing profiles so that you could run both maybe um, an integration test and a unit test yes. and have them separate? Yes, we do separated? want to allow you to have. Diff so uh, th there's two different things. There's, uh, we definitely want to help you with unit tests. It's kind of like difficult to. Uh, we, we want to improve the current situation because we understand that RoboElectric is not a perfect no, it's situation. Not. Um, it's very difficult. You know, I, I was answering that question in the fireside chat yesterday. Uh, there is, you know, pure unit test. If you're going to use any of the Android APIs or if you link against them, it's very difficult to run on a VM. Um, we, there are some things that we can do that we're going to try to do. Um, we also want to improve a lot, like the deployment time, because it's really where it runs doesn't really matter. What you want is quick turnaround, right? You want to be able to fix your test, do a change, run the test right away, and get the result. Right. If we can get that on a device, then it should be good enough. Well, it can uh, also run headless, because we'd run it right. on like Right, so you, we do also need to have, so that's the other part of it, right? We also need to make sure that on the CI server, you can run emulators there, start them just for that, and 
Um, we have plans for CI features. We just we just don't have them yet, but it's our plan to do that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Hi, my question is about training resources. I work at a community college where I teach Android programming, and I'm just wondering if you could recommend, uh, you know, it's a little bit difficult. Things are always changing. Textbooks are out of date. Uh, if you have any recommendations for people who are new to Android to point me towards certain resources. Yeah, I mean, we are in a weird situation right now where, you know, we're focusing a lot on Studio, but it's not 1.0, so the current website doesn't show a lot of uh, studio documentation because I, it's I just not read that there. there's, a, there's a new but course yes. being offered that is using studio. Yeah, wait, a so bunch of DevRel was working. Is, yeah. is so, that so the one on Udacity? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I saw that just went live, re like I think yesterday. Yep. Yeah. But we yeah. also, uh, I think we have some new documentation about Studio going live today with or yesterday with the website. Yeah. Uh, and on our way to 1.0, we are definitely going to improve the uh, online documentation to talk okay. more about Studio. Uh, and if you, can let us, if you can let us know what you find is lacking, that would also help you know, direct yeah. effort in the right places. I'd love to get together with you guys. Will you be at the Android booth yes. and yep. be able to yep. talk a little bit yes. so we Leave can talk there. about resources and things like that? Thank yes. you very yep. much. Uh, hi. Uh, I've got uh, two sort of short questions. Uh, um, one is, uh, do you plan on adding uh, C++ uh, NDK support uh, yes. to Android Studio? And how, how soon? Uh, we are starting to work on it. Okay. Will uh, that include de debugging support, C++ yes. debug? Yes. Okay, yep. great. Yes. Uh, second is uh, the import feature from Eclipse looks really nice, but I'm a little worried about um, how it's going to affect the restru the directory restructuring is going to affect our Git history because we've got a lot of Git history. Git is actually pretty good about recognizing file moves because it, unlike other version control systems, it doesn't, you don't have to tell it, I move this to that. It just looks at the file contents and figures out, hey, this looks like it corresponds right. to that. So, you know, given that there's no other edits that it makes to yeah. the files other than to move them, I'd be very surprised if Git didn't do a good job. Yeah, okay. it, it should just work. Yeah, we're not touching the file, so it will work. Great, thanks. Hi, uh, we have an app which has multiple DEX files, and uh, some time back we had tried to use Gradle, but the support for uh, building an APK with multiple DEX files was pretty limited then. Uh, has it changed uh, since, the, like, in the last few months, or no, it's still? Are there any plans to add support for that? Uh, I think so, but I don't know the detail really. But I, we know it's a situ it's a problem, and we're aware of it. But I don't think we have any ETA or announcement at this time. Is there any recommendations for workaround? What can we do to, do, uh, to still um, use? Yeah, I'm not like super familiar with that part, so I'm not sure. Uh, but we can talk after if you want to, sure. to get into okay. more details. Cool. Thank you. So you mentioned about the build config in your session, like feature one, false, feature two, two or true or something, right? So is that a work as a CP processor directives in the C, C++ where I can escape from the compilation or is it on the runtime it works? No, well? Um, well, so because it's a Boolean, right? It's a Boolean flag, Java C will just remove that code anyway. So in your code, if you have if feature, then do that. And you compile against a version of build config where that particular flag is false the code is going to disappear. Oh, so, uh, it's, so it's, it's not really per processor, but you won't have unused code in your code anyway. Oh, that code will not be included yeah. in my bank? Yeah. Because oh, you make it final, right? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because Thanks. it's just a constant Boolean, like a final Boolean, so okay. it just, you know, it's just being removed. Oh, thank you. Cool. Hey, um, I'm Lisa. I'm from Etsy. Um, I really like using Gradle. It's awesome. So thanks for all the work you guys have done. Um, I do have a kind of like a question slash request. Um, Gradleware does great job on documenting all of their APIs. So like figuring out how to use Gradle tasks is really easy. Um, do you guys have plans for similar API documentation for the Android plugin? Because right well, now it's been really it. hard to find yeah. stuff. Um, we, we definitely, you know, that's... Uh, you know, similar to the, the previous answer about training and documentation, you know, things are changing a lot, so we don't want to spend a lot of time on the documentation right now. Uh, and also, there's, um, I, I've seen like external plugin using a lot of the internal API, so we still need to figure out exactly what will be public and non-public, uh, but we do want to have, you know, because that's the goal, right, is to have a really extensible build system, so we need to document a lot of things, we need to have a lot of reference documentation, so long term, yes, uh, probably not before 1.0. Uh, we, we want to improve it because I think the current one is sort of out of date now. Uh, so we yeah. want to improve it. <laughs> but, we yeah. do, but we do have 
a, a Google group where you can basically ask about things. So if something isn't clear, you know, it, it might not be just lack of documentation. It might be an unintuitive API we should fix. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sometimes it's hard to see when you do changes to the API. Like you have to know to follow the right group and like G plus right. or yes. beyond the. Yeah. Well, we're list. we're hoping to stop breaking everybody. Yeah. Soon. That's the goal of beta, right? It's to be more stable. Um, I mean, there are some you know, unintended breakage when we realize that people are using API, maybe they shouldn't. Uh, so we can't do much about that. But the public APIs, I think, are more stable now and will deprecate rather than break them. So we, are, we can start documenting them. So I'm sorry, we're basically out of time. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to go to the booth on the second floor. So if you have questions, please you know, join yeah. us there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.